I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're all in black. We're all in black. Like a yeah. band. Like literally. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a really, Did we sort a, of like a bad indie band who's... <laughs> We should have a WhatsApp group and, you know, every time we're on the same time the night before, I'll just hit blue. Yeah, we are. We're like one of these 80s revival bands that have drafted in a younger member <laughs> after the, our singer died in some tragic circumstances. Like Queen. Isn't <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, Clodo, welcome. Um, so the reason we are talking today is because an extremely interesting cold case murder trial has opened in the Central Criminal Court. A man called Noel Long in his 70s from Cork is facing trial for the murder of Nora Sheehan. A long forgotten case. A long forgotten case. This happened 42 years ago. Um, You know, this woman was 54 at the time that she died. Uh, she went missing for a number of days and her body was found in basically undergrowth at the side of a river, at the side of a road in mm. County Cork. Right. So 42 years ago, 1981. One. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got the 80 bit, which was good. Um, and uh, this case is, it's before the courts as a result of a cold case investigation, which was... Uh, conducted by the Serious Crime Review Team. Now, we have to stick to what we've heard because this is a case that's before a jury. It's not like the Special Criminal Court where Mm -hmm. we're freer to talk. So we're going to be very careful and we're just going to go through the opening statement, which which laid out the state's case. And then we'll talk to you about what you witnessed today in court and, and you heard. So what has been the opening case by the state? Well, I think a lot of it seems to focus on on DNA evidence um, that was that was uh, taken in at the time, obviously, but um, was formed part of a cold case review. We heard that, and was subsequently, I think, sent to a, a lab in the UK. Um, that um, so obviously there were samples taken at the time. The technology didn't exist to extract. DNA profiles, uh, or at least it wasn't as sophisticated. Mm. It certainly wasn't at then. Um, mm. Obviously, the, the the cold case unit it was referred to in court as the cold case unit, even though they that's their kind of nickname. It's the kind of their nickname. Yeah. But even even uh, the the prosecuting barrister acknowledged that that's what they're known as. And um, obviously, the there were samples taken at the time, and it'll be part of the prosecution's case that uh, once this was sent to the UK. A sample was extracted um, and that was matched to the accused, according to the prosecution. Mm. And it was said in the opening statement that there was uh, a one to uh, 20,000 chance that this was not Noel Young, or sorry, Noel Noel Long. Uh, Obviously, Mr. Long has pled not guilty Mm -hmm. and will put forward another case. Um, And so that's going to, I think, be the centre of the case. There was some other evidence given from the prosecution about how there was other samples taken from a car he was driving mm-hmm. um, and he was stopped in the days after the case and some samples were taken from his car, including s- stuff like carpet fibres. They're going to make a case that this matches other um, samples taken from uh, the body of the victim. So this is very much different to recent court cases we have been and a a lot of gangland stuff would be around circumstantial evidence as we talk about where the various threads are brought together to form the case. But this is really going to be sort of focused on the advances in science since Nora Sheehan's death. Absolutely, yeah. So like a lot of the, the stuff, I mean, that we're seeing now in this case, in terms of the evidence, I don't think back then, especially, you wouldn't have had the kind of the technology to be able to extract those fibers and to be mm. able to extract those certain things and match them to a certain degree, especially to such a high degree that you can now. I mean, the things that they can do with mm. forensic technology, you know, now and even in 10 years is going to be so different. Um, but also, given the age of the case and 
the way that they're able to solve it, it gives such great hope for all those years of, of cases and all those deceased women and, and missing women even that have yet to mm. see a court inside of a courtroom that there is hope that that can happen. Yeah, I mean... The Serious Crime Review Team, which is the proper name for the Cold Case Unit, was set up around the mid 2000s from memory, around 2006. And I remember at the time there had there was a, more than 200 unsolved murder cases in Ireland that had dated back to, you know, maybe they took, I think they actually cut it off at some point. There was maybe, it was maybe going back 40 or 50 mm -hmm. years at the time. And what they did was they looked at all these cases and they kind of rated them in how, you know, what chances there was of solving them. And a lot of them where there were some forensic, uh, you know, there had been some, some samples taken, they would have been high on the agenda because of the advances in science at that point and because of what they had hoped were going to be the further advances. So um, there's been a few cases that they've had before the courts over the past, say, 10 years, not that many, they mm. are sporadic. I mean, the, the, the reinvestigating a crime that happened so long ago is a huge job and they're a small team and getting them, getting it to a place where the DPP will, um, you know, order those charges to be brought is is an achievement in itself. So we'll see going forward where this, how this case does. It's going to be probably about a four week case. Absolutely. You're yeah. going to drop in and out of it. What does the accused look like? Um, he has like a smallish guy, bald. It actually struck me that he was in his 70s. He doesn't look like he's in his 70s. Um, he looks younger. He does look younger. And I think it's because he has no hair that he looks a lot younger. Um, you know, he's got a small kind of goatee beard. He was sat in, in the court kind of, he was wearing a blue anorak um, kind of hands in his pockets, very kind of relaxed almost, but, you know, intently still watching. And, and, and who's there in the court? Do you know? I mean, obviously, you've only just dipped into it. You don't know who the characters are. But is there a lot of members of the public coming in to hear it? Or is it is it is it quite intensely just investigators? It seems to be a lot of investigators. And from the members of the public that were there, I would assume were family of both the victim. And I would take a guess that maybe the perpetrator as well or the accused because of the way, you know, the, the court is split. Obviously, on one side, you've got your prosecutor and you've got the jury. And then the other side, you've got your defense and you've got the accused and just kind of kind of like at a wedding yeah. you've got one family one side and the other yeah. the other it was sort of like that so I would guess that at the moment it is just close people close to the story I mean, they described as well I think didn't they um, some of the the obviously the the passage of time is 42 years as you said I mean I don't think they had a, a, a direct cause of death um, because she was found the, the victim was found in the aftermath of a good number of time and there was never a, an actual clear uh, cause of death established, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, the evidence that they have um, is semen evidence. Um, and but when it comes to then the rest of the, when her actual body, I mean, we heard evidence today of the fact that there was kind of um, wildlife activity on, on the body. Um, so it obviously had been there for a number of days. And um, they do say that she died between, I think, between the... 6th and the 12th so somewhere yeah she went missing on the 6th and, and she was found on the 12th so somewhere in those previous six days she what passed away that? so it was in June right. so obviously the weather would have been a bit warmer they did say it was quite wet and raining so obviously you've got that as well washing away any potential DNA that was on the body Um, I guess as well the fact that she was found the manner in which her body was found was very it was posed in such a sexual nature you know she had no shoes on mm. um the, her tights were around one ankle uh, her dress was pulled up over her head um there was a shoe and her coat was kind of down further the other side of the body you know headed towards the river so it was kind of a road then briars and shrubbery and then there was kind of a slope down into a river is kind of what they um described it as mm. so it seemed like you know, her body was kind of left lying there and then you could see, you know, for whatever reason that the clothing was, the garments were, were kind of trailing down the other side. But yeah, like, just given how long that, that she was there and, you know, they did say that um, because of kind of that wildlife activity and stuff like that on the body, one guardie had said, one of the technical um, guards did say that, you know, there was there was wounds on her body. Uh, I think that we had mentioned that the night before she went missing, she had been in with the doctor in the hospital because she had a bite uh, from a dog in her arm. And they did mention that kind of bandage. So obviously, you know, that wasn't part of how she died. She, they did say she had a cut on her neck and another cut in her arm. But again, they still couldn't determine 
exactly how she had she had passed away. So the prosecutors are continuing to to lay out their opening statement. Obviously, they they are prosecuting the case, so they're making a case that that um, uh, no long is guilty. We didn't mm. yet hear from anything from the defence that's going to be brought. No, not yet. I mean, uh, you know, obviously when the the prosecution asks questions of the witness, the, the defence also gets a chance to ask and there was no kind of questions mm-hmm. asked um, there because it was very much straightforward. It was, what's your name, guard? The what reading date? in the crime yeah, scene. Exactly, and what, what age yeah. are these gar- guards? I mean, They're retired, I presume, now at yeah, this stage. Yeah, I think the oldest one that was there was 86. Wow. Sorry, 83. And the rest of them were kind of in their 70s. So they are kind of that bit older. And did they read out their original statements to them and then ask some questions around no, it? No, actually, this was interesting. So there was one of the guardy was, was kind of, because it happened so long ago, he wanted to read from a statement and, and the defence said, no, you can't read from the statement. You can have a look at it and you can kind of refresh your memory, but kept objecting to the fact that he was reading verbatim from the statement. So they, they did get a chance to kind of go back and just go over names and stuff like that. Because again, they, you know, these statements were taken 42 years ago at this yeah. point. And, you know, as you might think, you go in to refresh your memory, but th- there's so many names you have to list out. You know, there was 10 guards at the scene at one time and it was at this time. I can't remember this, what happened 42 minutes ago, uh, yeah, let alone exactly. 42 so, years yeah, ago. So they, they did have to kind of go it's in incredible. and have to read through their statements. The um, In his opening, Brendan Grahan, senior counsel, um, who's prosecuting, said that, I'm going to just read this to get it accurate, that said that Miss Sheehan lived in... Bally Filan in Cork City with her husband James, who was somewhat older than her and who died in 1985. The couple had three sons, James Jr., Jeremiah and Hugh, all of whom are still alive and two of whom were present in the court the day of the opening, which was uh, Wednesday, was it? Wednesday, Wednesday. yeah. Um, the, and the barrister said one of those two sons of, of her sons will, will be giving evidence in the case. She had previously worked in a hospital, had suffered some sort of a fall there and some sort of ill health, whether arising from that or otherwise. He said the jury would hear from various witnesses that knew or had seen Miss Sheen around the time of her death. And she had developed some eccentricities, they call it. She had been described previously as vulnerable um, and has so, had some obsessions about a nearby hospital. So something happened to her in the course of her work. Yes. She fell and obviously there was a, a slight change in her personality that maybe is significant to this case in that this happened in around the time mm-hmm. of her of her death. And um, Brendan Grahan said that as a result of that, she was often seen out on the roads near her home and on public streets attempting to wave down cars and talking to people about the goings on at the hospital where she was concerned about. And he said she would be described in modern parlance as a vulnerable person. Now, this is going to be key in the in the case as well. So presumably there'll be more evidence heard around that and around this fall and this slight change in her in her personality as yeah, we go on. And I mean it says, you know, that because uh, the night before she went missing, the night that she did go missing rather, she had been at the hospital for that shot. Uh sorry, yeah. she had a tetanus shot because she had been bitten by the dog and she was bandaged up. And after that happened, she was once again seen kind of out waving cars and, right. and again, you know, uh behaving oddly as they as they say. So that witness will be there will be witnesses that are, you know, saying that she was between midnight until and until as late as four AM um she was seen. Mm-hmm. So for you know, between four hours after she left the hospital. And did it give any indication of how long the the trial is expected to last? Yeah, it's expected to last for about four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well we'll we'll um we'll dip in again next week and um we'll we'll talk to Alison O'Reardon of course who's going to be covering the the case for us and for other media outlets and uh, I think this is really going to be an interesting trial going forward. It's not often that we have these cold case trials before the courts and um they yeah, they will pose unique challenges and, and yeah. it will be definitely in one to watch. Great. Absolutely. Okay, thanks Cloda. Thank you.